Today I wanted to go over the complete blood count, and I wanted to do this just to kind of cover the different things you're going to see in it. I'm not going to cover everything. I'm not going to cover, you know, a lot of the MCV, MCH, MCHC, just because right now they're not that important. It gets a little bit more complex, but I will cover the main other functions that you're going to see. So first of all, I want to talk about when do you order a CBC? Now for a CBC, you're either going to order it for a routine health checkup, and if it's normal, you probably won't order another one until something happens, and that leads to the second point. If the person is showing signs of an infection, it is not a bad idea to order a CBC. And then also on a regular basis, check for people with some type of deficiency, you know, anemia, to track their progress. And to really get into this, I'm going to just go over each main point, and then I'm going to scroll back up and allow you to see what, this is a blood count that has normal, so is in, within normal limits, and then we'll go back down and we'll talk about it. But there's three main features you need to focus on, and that's, first of all, the white blood cell count. This is your white blood cell count, and normally you're going to be in the ranges of 4.0 to 10.5, and there's, you know, wiggle room, each person's different, so you can't just use that, but it's a good starting point. And this is per unit of blood, what we'll say. So the next thing we're going to look at is platelet count. And your platelet count, you'll see platelets right here. And your normal limits for this are probably 140 to 415, and this is going poor unit of blood. And you'll see this patient is uh, 268, which is within normal limits. So that's not concerning. And then red blood cell count. And your red blood cell count is right here, RBC. And it's actually a little bit more tightly regulated. You're going to see about 4.1 to 5.6. There's less wiggle room, but again, you have a little bit above and beyond, above and below, depending on the patient. So let's start about let's start out with a white blood cell count. And the first thing you're going to realize about your white blood cell count is one of the most important signs of infection. And also, let me add at the end, I'm going to go over an abnormal. CBC and we'll kind of try to figure out what we can gather from what we're seeing. So white blood cell count, if you see a value that's higher than 10.5, and I mean, you know, not just 11, but maybe significantly higher, you can gather that there's something wrong with the patient. You know, he could either have, you know, inflammation and acute infection or tissue death. And then if it tends to have anything, and higher, of course, we're going to look at Higher would be leukocytosis. And as I said, this is commonly seen in infection, acute infection, inflammation, acute infection, or tissue death. The other one is leukopenia, which is a low count of white blood cells. And this can show anything from autoimmune, immune system infections, most commonly you'll hear HIV, reaction to medication. This one is largely ignored by a lot of people, but it can be a sign for leukopenia cancer medications, and then severe infection. And severe infection, let me explain that one, is, is if you have a really low white blood cell count and you have a severe infection, your white blood cells might be getting used up faster than they can be produced. So it'll show a lower white blood cell rather than a higher one, which can lead to some differential diagnosis. So there's five subgroups to white blood cells. And the first one we're going to look at is neutrophil. And this one very closely matches the white blood cell count, which is you know, to be expected because it's, because it's the most predominant inside white blood cells. And neutrophils, there's either a low count, which we're going to consider neutropenia, and that can be a severe infection, again, because you're using them up faster than you can get them, or an immune deficiency. And neutrophilia is where you're going to see more neutrophils, and that's with probably going to be an acute bacterial infection. And I say that because you know, you're not using them up too fast, you'll see an increased amount, and that's normally used for bacterial infections. Another way to look at this is the difference between banned neutrophils, which I'll say are immature neutrophils, versus regular neutrophils. And if you have a high count of bands or a high percentage of banned neutrophils, you can especially, you're going to especially see that in bacterial infections. The next thing we got to look at is leukocytes. And the three main cell types that work for the immune system are just your B cells, T cells, and natural killer cell types. 
And this is especially where you're going to see the T cells, HIV attacks the T cells. So that's where you're going to see your leukocytopenia, which is your lack of leukocytes, leukocytopenia. And that's autoimmune, that's, well, autoimmune, which could be lupus or rheumatoid arthritis infection, particularly viral, as I said, HIV. And then some corticosteroids can cause leukocyto leukocytopenia. Leukocytosis would be an increase in leukocytes. And you're mostly going to see that in acute viral infections. Some bacterial infections, but you're mostly going to see that if it's pertussis or whooping cough, and sometimes TB, tuberculosis. So that's when you'll see it in bacterial infections. And this, of course, is not all-encompassing. This is just a quick overview. The next thing we're going to look at is monocytes. <laughs> and for this one, a low count is not significant, meaning that if you have a low monocyte count and that's all, you can't make a diagnosis just based on that. You'll see it a lot with chronic infections, and that's when you can see. Uh, that's when it can become medically significant, because if you know that the, per the patient has a chronic infection, but his monocyte count is low, you may want to consider something else being an issue there. And a lot of times you'll see this <coughs> a high count in something like infective endocarditis, a fungal infection, tuberculosis. And infective, infective endocarditis works in the heart, so it's a cardio thing. Eosinophils is the next type of subgroup of white blood cell. And eosinophil Normally a low count is not medically significant. You're normally going to see a low eosinophil count in a healthy patient. Let me go up and show you. First of all, let's look at the lymphocytes. You'll see lymphocytes and your neutrophils nearly the same value, but this one has a higher range from 1.8 to 7.8. This one just from 0.7 to 4.5. So, and let me, again, this is the absolute count. And then your monocytes, you know, it's low, but that's not concerning because it should be if there's no long-standing infection. Eosinophil count 0.1, and you from 0.0 to 0.4, and go back down to eosinophil. You'll see this if you have an allergenic reaction, if there's a parasite, or some types of inflammation. And this could be like, let's look at bowel diseases. So if you have celiac disease or inflamed bowel disease, you'll see an elevated eosinophil count. And the same goes for the basophil, and that's, you're going to see again an inflammation or allergic reaction, and it's normally going to be low. Like, you don't want an elevated basophil count. So you'll see that this one is even 0.0, .0 and that's just the normal range, 0.0, 0.0, .0, .0. The next thing you're going to see is red blood cells. And anemia is the lack of red blood cells, and you'll see that in chronic chronic and acute bleeding if you know you have a very if you get stabbed and you're bleeding out then you'll see anemia or chronic bleeding you know if you don't clot that's anemia and a lot of times you also see it in chronic inflammatory disease the other type is polycythemia which is an excess of red blood cells and that's most commonly seen in dehydration so you have more red blood cells than normally it can also be genetic and then pulmonary diseases so anything that deals with the lungs can cause polycythemia or an excess of red blood cells. Let's go up and look quickly at his red blood cell count. So his red blood cell count, 5.27 with a normal range, and then you'll see these two are going to be connected to your red blood cell count, your hemoglobin and hemocrit. Your hemoglobin is just your oxygen transport protein. So you'll see these match very closely up with your red blood cell. If your red blood cells are in the normal range, for the most part, your hemoglobin and your hemocrit are going to be also in the same range. You'll see this one is normal, so is this one. This one's normal, so is this one. They're right about in the middle. And your hemocrit is your percent red blood cells in the blood. So it's how much of your blood is red blood cells. The third type is the platelet count. The thrombocytopenia is the lack of platelets. This one's important because you'll see it a lot in sepsis, a viral infection, and a lot of the times drugs can cause thrombocytopenia, something that again is also ignored way too often. They don't really look at if it's a sulfa drug or a quinidine can cause thrombocytopenia. And then thrombocytosis is an excess of platelets. And this can be cancer or iron deficiency anemia. And again, let me add that this is not all-encompassing. 
This is just a quick overview. So now that we've taken a look at what a normal CBC looks like, and let's look quickly at our platelet count, normal, in normal range. So let's go down and let's look at a CBC that's not normal. So I've, I've just isolated some of the important ones in this value. The first thing we're going to look at, let's look at our white blood cell count. So we have a 33.6 white blood cell count. And you can see that this is well over the 10.6 normal range. So the first thing we're going to say, okay, so there possibly could be an infection. This isn't necessarily worth starting to treat. You're going to have to look also at the patient if there's a fever, anything else like that. But since we only have the lab values, we're just going to use these as a reference tool. So the next thing we look at is the red blood cell count. The red blood cell count is low. It's not significantly low, but it is low. And you can see here that your hemoglobin and your hemocrit also followed it down. So like I said, they're normally going to stay together with the red blood cells. And what we were saying about your red blood cells, if it, it could show an acute or chronic bleeding or a chronic inflammatory disease. And it can also show other things, so it's not enough to draw on. So let's go to the next thing we see. So these values, we didn't talk about them, so we're not going to look at them. But we do see a low platelet count. And what I was saying about the platelet count is it can also be, it can show acute viral infection, and it can also, less commonly, but it can show acute bacterial infection. And we see we have 11 here, which is significantly low. It's under 156 significantly. So we're probably looking at some type of infection, but let's look at the different types of white blood cells to confirm this. This, you'll see your um, polys is a little bit elevated, not significantly, so we're not going to really use that as any type of differential. But here we have your bands, and I was talking earlier about band neutrophils, and how it can show inflammation, especially in an acute bacterial infection. And we see here that its absolute number is 2.35. And that is almost triple what its highest range is. So if you combine your white blood cell count, elevated, could show infection. Low platelet count could show bacterial infection. And then your neutrophil count, your neutroph band's neutrophil count, which will most likely show bacterial infection, we can conclude from just the lab values that this person most likely has some type of bacterial infection. And then your next steps should be based on this and then other personal, not personal, but in-person diagnoses like your temperature and your range values. And for the last thing, let me add that this is only looking at one, one CBC. And a lot of the times what you need to do is you need to look at different days. So where this might be a really low platelet count, it also might continually be low. And this is not abnormal, though this would be abnormal no matter what. A low platelet count does not necessarily mean some type of infection because we don't know any references for this particular patient. So this is a quick look at what all these actually do and how you can use them for differential diagnosis.